The Bo and Luke Show. Inspiring you to be better, know better, and do better. Welcome to the Bo and Luke Show with a diverse lineup of guests, from NFL players to CEOs. It's real and it's raw. From the Hale Media Group, here are your hosts, Robert Bo Bravo and Luke Carrington. What does it take to be an NFL agent, an attorney? an entrepreneur, a CEO, a husband, a father, and so much more. Hi, folks. I'm Bo. And I'm Luke. Welcome to our inaugural episode of the Bo and Luke Show. Uh, It's uh, an energetic, emotional, and dynamic podcast to motivate you to be, know, and do better. Uh, Let's answer that question and inspire fire today. So today in studio, we have none other than Vince Kahlo who is all of those things and then some. Uh, without further ado, Vince, we welcome you to the Bo and Luke Show. I, I am honored to be the inaugural guest. Gotten to know Bo over at Michigan. Would love to jump into, into the podcast and the show. Cool, so let's jump into it, man. So you have to take Luke and I and everybody that's listening, you gotta take us back to the beginning. One thing Luke and I wanna get out of all of our guests It's not just about you and all the things that you've done, but we want to get into how you got there. Where'd you grow up? What influences did you have? Is there anything that drove you to become an attorney to start with? I mean, how did, how did you even get to the, to that point? It's a great question. We want great answers. (laughs) (laughs) I think it all starts with the, with the big Italian family. You could cue in the Godfather music. Now we had nine people in a pretty small house in, uh, in Ohio, Cleveland suburb. Just grew up in this big, crazy Italian family. I was four or five. Grandparents lived with, a set of grandparents lived with us. Just aunts and uncles everywhere and kind of probably gave me a little bit of confidence and audacity and, and that whole thing. Um, and my actual real life godfather was an attorney and successful guy and all that kind of stuff. So he definitely had an influence on, on career path and, you know, just kind of saw, you know, him grow into a really strong professional. Had a little, always kind of had a little fire in my belly, if you will. And where were you in, in the mix of your brothers and sisters? Are you the oldest, youngest? Are you in the middle? So, so I, am the, I am the youngest son, four of five children. So my, my older brother is, is, no offense, Frank, but considerably older. The la- I was supposed to be the baby. I think my little sister was kind of a mistake, but um, <clears throat> I was supposed to be the baby. She, Hope she mom took and dad the- <laughs> aren't listening to the, to the episode. Yeah. She, she took my baby title, and that's probably what, what ticked me off. I, I, maybe that was the first you know, chip on the shoulder at, at, at five. I was supposed to be the baby and get all the attention. Gia, my little sister, took that away from me. Yeah, but we love Gia today. We do. She's awesome. <laughs> she is awesome. And how about undergrad? Where did you go? Football was like my first love. Mm-hmm. Football, football, football. This is how. Did you play I, football? I'm going I'm to age myself here. I'm so old that when I was young, the Browns were like really good. Knocking on the door, going to the Super Bowl. Um, we fell short, of course, uh, in Cleveland fashion. But uh, we were really good every year. So I was you know, just a Cleveland Browns fanatic. My older brother played football, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be like my older brother, and so just started playing football third grade through college, and uh, my first year of college, I went to Mount Union. Uh, I think they call it Mount, the University of Mount Union these days, but mm. Little Mount Union competes for national titles every year, and, you know, D3, I was, I was hoping and praying for this growth spurt. It never came, so by the time I got to Mount Union, my body was pretty much running on empty, uh, broken bones, shoulders. And then, uh, one year at Mount sort of, sort of ended the, the, the playing career busted up my ankle. I don't know, miraculously all my financial aid kind of went away. Mm. Another story for another day. But so I, so I ended up finishing up at Akron sort of focused on scholastics after my football career ended. Yeah. So, so when you're talking to your players, do you talk about your football career? Do they look at you like you're, like you're nuts? <laughs> like, yeah, okay, <laughs> we believe you. They, um, 
they definitely, definitely get a kick out of my football prowess as I was, <laughs> as I was growing up. My, my sack record at my, my high school. I actually have, I have a couple of videos on my phone. I don't know if video cameras around when I was young, but um, somehow there's some videos out there. So I sit next to these huge NFL guys or, you know, at, at minimum, really, really excellent college football players at, you know, major universities. And they're like, all right, you know, what position do you play? Do you like the punter, the, the little running back, little receiver? I'm like, no, it's a D tackle. And they <laughs> literally fall out of their chairs. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, so, so then take us into law school. Like what, how did you get there? Where'd you go to law school? What's law school at New York Law School in Manhattan? Um, and just sort of, you know, grew up in Ohio, lived in Ohio, had my sights set on, on tackling the Big Apple. It's a recurring theme in life is always sort of tackle, you know, big challenges, whatever's in front of me, whatever I could get to. You know, wanted to move to Manhattan and, and just sort of experience that and decided to, to make the leap. Didn't, didn't know anybody. Um, just, just moved to Manhattan, <laughs> just sort of picked up and yeah. So you graduate, you come back to Cleveland. Is that what you did? Yes. Yes. Lived in, lived in a 400 square foot apartment, um, in Manhattan, bathroom, kitchen, living area, the whole bit. And the wall started sort of closing in just sort of seeing, you know, some folks, uh, some of my best friends born and raised in New York City and they're like, yeah, you know, my parents drive in two hours every day and drive home to, I'm like, I, I can't get into that. I can't get into long commutes or, or, or raising a family and all that stuff. So probably the mid Midwest roots kind of started kicking in towards the end, decided sure. to take the bar back in Ohio. Awesome. Luke, what you got for events before we get oh into God. the, before we get into the raw stories of, uh, recruiting players and how all that goes. Uh, what do you got? I can't wait into this, first of all. So, like, Vince, I've been obsessed. I think I've been talking to your off about it. But, like, if I could go back in time and, you know, try to do it right, you know, I'd probably be doing your job right now. Now, we all have different journeys, so I didn't do that. I mean, is it always something that you, you think you wanted to do? Or was it something you had the skills for and then, and then fell into? Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Like, did you just know that this is what you wanted to do? Sort of going through um, football was always like, a, you know, major love. I would go read the sports section of the newspaper when they had newspapers with my grandfather every morning, you know, and just football was like my first love. So I, so I, obviously I, I unfortunately never got that growth spurt. So I was able to sort of transition you know, passion for, for football and sports, um, into education and, and, you know, legal work, I guess, and sort of married the two. It was, it was, it was, it was a passion thing. I love playing it sort of able to marry both of those. Yeah. Awesome. That's good. What, what other thing, and this is kind of neither here nor there, but how do you feel about Ohio state, you know, coming from Michigan and everything and being in Ohio? <laughs> I am, um, I'm a, I'm an honest guy. And I got to say, Ohio, I, I was a Buckeye fan, especially as a young guy. I mean, I don't know if I could say this on, on podcast, but um, being candid, I, I probably would have knifed uh, Jim Harbaugh when I was like six. <laughs> six. I saw him on the street. I remember him beating. I remember him beating Ohio State, uh, Shem Beckler. And, and, and Michigan, you know, again, aging myself here, but Michigan beat Ohio State every year when I, when I was little. So, but getting into the profession, I don't want to jump ahead, but. Um, some things changed. Yeah. That's probably even when the Lions were good. And I love the Lions. They're my team. The whole Michigan, Ohio State uh, rivalry, the competition, I mean, it's really like no other. Uh, even I, you know, having main residence here in Ohio now and being a Michigan grad, um, doing grad school with you. And I, I, it's so fun to walk into the local coffee shops with your Michigan gear on and just stare down the, <laughs> the old guys you know drinking coffee like what the what you just really walked in here in that shirt and hat and it's like hey last time I checked you know Wolverine's pretty tough don't know what a Buckeye probably gonna eat that thing or something right <laughs> um so take us you know I've seen in the past some of your slide decks on the whole NFL agency uh and how it works you didn't go to 
a big agency like a CCA or anything, big sports talent agency, you started your own. That how, how do you even do that and compete with the behemoths out there that are, you know, promising the world to these players? Well, um, much like, much like our hail, <coughs> hail ventures and consulting practice, which we are launching, just sort of reached the point of, I, I did a ton of research. I talked to people. I was at that point, I was a business lawyer. Um, and I was, I was nearing the big three Oh, and it was kind of like now or never to, to go get licensed with the NFLPA. That's a whole process in and of itself. But, um, nobody really opened the door for me. I just sort of decided to, um, sort of kick it in, I guess. And sort of the genesis of, of, of me or whatever, whatever, what, what makes me tick. If something is, is there in front of me, I, I will go get it. Uh, and it's something I want. Um, and I, I couldn't really, I'm not, I'm not really suited to go sit in a big office space and, you know, tell the boss how great his tie looks and um, sort of climb that ladder and go through that. So I just, applied really the work ethic and, you know, some of the football background and knowledge that I had. Some of my best buddies at Akron played, played D1 ball and, you know, mm-hmm. were knocking on the door of NFL careers and had a cup of coffee in the NFL and that type of thing. So just grassroots it. Some of my buddies coach, you know, really powerful programs in Ohio, sort of took an analytical approach to players that I would target and say, okay, this guy, you know, he's, his height weight fits the NFL profile. He had really good statistical year. Um, and let's, let's go, let's go approach him. Asked up the car. I, you know, I wasn't going super far outside of my network to start. Um, took sort of a grassroots approach and everybody told me I was crazy, including my wife. You know, I had kind of a nice cushy, uh, corporate law practice, but took the leap. Awesome. So who was your very first player that you signed? Very first player I signed was uh, a kid from uh, Cleveland Glenville and he was at, he was at Purdue (laughs) and the, the connection was I knew his uncle from, from Cleveland. His uncle worked in a nightclub establishment in Cleveland and uh, no, not a strip club. (laughs) Um, You know, whatever talked about his nephew and, Looked at the player, had great size, had great speed. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't like the superstar of the team. But, um, yeah, that was our, it was like right around uh, Thanksgiving time, um, like in 2010. And that was, that was the first client. And he ended up, he, you know, he ended up kind of sticking around for a few years and um, in and out of the league and, and, and fighting for roster spots. So I had a decent eye for talent. Awesome. Yeah, that, that brings up a good point, right, in what you said. It, you used network, right? You got started with the network. You knew somebody. You knew somebody. And then I'd like to point out to folks who are listening, because we talk about it all the time in today's world, it's network, network, network. You want to get a job. You want to get a client. You want to increase your business, right? It, it, it's really all about your network, right? And you've been doing that for a long time, helped you land your first player. Where do you go from there? Every year, you, you know, you just kind of, you, you service, provide good service, bust your hump for, for your clients. And then, you know, they kind of would go back into their locker rooms and say, Hey, this guy did what he said, said what he did, you know, type of thing. And, um, you know, I think my third year in the business, I had a day two draft pick, um, who I just had dinner with, you know, a couple of days ago, he ended up, you know, being the, the first, you know, the first big client, um, and whatever, just had to have a great relationship with them. And he's, you know, going to be working with us at Hale and, and the whole bit. Nice. But, That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, and, we're, and in a little bit, we're going to get into questions that we literally have from our office or from our audience, um, mm-hmm. from multiple States, right? They want, they have, they have questions for you. Oh right. So we have, we have to get into that. But, but you're signing clients, you're getting, you know, their NFL contract and so forth. But what else are you doing for them? When you talk about great service, right? We want to hear the, because we know you have them, right? Start us on that journey with some of those wild and crazy stories. Well, just anything 
what's what's what was it it was a great training ground being you know being in in that industry and i still am in the industry at the time being a thousand you know miles an hour in, into that agent agency world it was just anything and everything from sign the player they sign a standard rep agreement and yeah. usually they'll go home for whatever you know, week or two before they start training in that week or two it was well, I was at a party and I was with this girl and whatever, you know, we were making out and a mirror fell off the wall. I, I needed a few hundred bucks. Can you help me out? Blah, blah, blah. Just anything and everything, you know, and, and just, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I have an assistant and full-time assistant and an intern, you know, you get, you get 10 guys, you know, give or take, it's just, Madness, madness, and mayhem. Because you know you're with you're with young younger folks. You take care of the clients, and at the same time, you say you know got to be smarter than that. Moving on to a different chapter of your life, we could all go back to when we were 21, 22. We mm-hmm. were all, I'm sure, had maybe not you, Bo, but <laughs> no, I don't think God. Time out. <laughs> you're on the hot seat today. <laughs> not, Bo, not Luke. Thanks, it's Vince. Thank God there was no Twitter or, or any yeah, no things kidding. around for, for Vince at 21 or 22. But I tell my daughters that today. I don't know that they get it. I hope they get it. <laughs> I don't know. Your daughters are like buying houses and stuff at 22. They're, they're, they're with it. You know, you try, to, you try to help sort of guide them from a life management perspective and then also you know, provide legal advice and business advice. The crazy thing is, you know, those guys would need help. You know, and then like three minutes, you know, three months later, um, you know, a handful of my guys, you know, got drafted and big signing bonus checks and getting, you know, three hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar wires, you know. So it was, it's really, really, it was a really cool uh, experience and, and, and training ground. Deal yeah, with that's, that's life changing for them, right? Yes. I remember, um, I think it was last year, 2018, uh, first time uh, my wife and I came over to your house, uh, we had dinner, but you were late and you were out at a car dealership helping one of your players uh, buy a car because you didn't, just didn't know how all of that worked, right? So that, that to me, I think, I think that is super cool, super important about what you're delivering to them. And it's not just, hey, I'm here to help you sign with the Indianapolis Colts and we're going to get endorsement deals and I'm going to get you through all your contracts. And I'm also an attorney. So I can look at, look at those contracts, make sure they're good. And it's a win-win for everybody. But Oh, by the way, you know, what I think is cool is you're, you're a mentor. You're a big brother to these guys. So and not just to him, I'm sure, I'm sure you have numerous stories. What, what's that like? No, it's, it's um, sort of, you know, took the responsibility and take the responsibility seriously in terms of like just providing guidance, life, life management guidance and, and caring, I guess, at the end of the day, whether it was a big issue, a small issue, um, you know, getting the mirror fixed, get, you know, helping them with their first car purchase um, to, you know, negotiating a $20 million deal with Harvard, you know, GM, Harvard educated GMs and, and, uh, you know, analytics division. So mm-hmm. just, just, it was just a great, just a great experience and, and continues to be. Um, but, you know, some recruiting stories were also just wild. And- yeah. So good segue, right? So you have to, obviously these players are, I mean, they're the elite athletes, right? So what I think, you know, we can joke about high school football, right? But these guys are, I mean, they're becoming elite in high school, high school to college. And then you know, hopefully they get to the NFL. At what point are you looking at their stats, running data, doing the analytics? At what point in in those players' football career period? What point is it college? When, what year during their college uh, career are you starting to really home in on, hey, maybe this, maybe this guy's got potential? So as, as the practice sort of stabilized, um, I would I would look at sort of schools that that were in the geographic area primarily. Again, going back to to your network statement, you know who was in our network? Were there guys from the high schools that we, you know, got clients at? 
sure. out in USC. You know, I had some guys you know, from, from all over the country, but there was typically some connection either to a player, to a coach friend, to, you know, to the network. Um, from those connections, I would start looking at guys, even if they went to school as a freshman, like, all right, I got to keep tabs on this guy. Let's yeah. see what he does, you know, type of thing. Mm-hmm. This year with, with the hail launch and, and kind of knowing where, where, where we were going um, is the first year I didn't recruit any rookies, as you know, and I don't really plan on doing so, you know, moving forward, maybe ever, maybe, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll jump back in, but it's, it's um, the first year in a decade, but a little, a little crazy, a little scary, not, you know, not to kind of gas up and start hitting, hitting the rounds in September and, you know, over the summer and that kind of thing, but it was also it's kind of nice. Yeah, <laughs> not having to wake up at four in the morning the day after Christmas, yeah. running here and so. So, so you were making a comment. Um, the the movie with uh, I think it was Brad Pitt. He played Billy Bean. Billy Bean. Billy Bean doing the data crunching for baseball. Um, you were doing that before Billy Bean, weren't you? <sighs> Billy Bean, Paul. Uh, I forgot the guy's name with the Browns. It's like running the Browns. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it was always, so I, I, my first, my first draft was 2010. And yeah, I was just always sort of like numbers, analytics, mm-hmm. statistics, play time percentage versus production, how many tackles, how many sacks, how many interceptions, how many, you know, uh, successful plays there were. And like pro football focus is like the big stat sort of partner for, for college guys, NFL guys. And um, they had launched kind of right, right around that time, 2010, you know, or started gaining some traction. So um, I forgot when that movie came out, but shortly thereafter. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so I was already, I was already like really attaching. Um, and it was, you know, probably from the legal education and yeah. uh, practicing law, you know, looking at facts and, and, and data um, and, and applying them to facts and well, whatever. Our producer has your back. So it's Paul <laughs> De Panestra. Paul De Podesta. P- De Podesta. Moneyball was the movie. Yes. Right? That's why it's so That's important to have movie. a great team supporting your podcast and your video show because <laughs> they got you, your back. Jimmy, you got yeah, it. Thank you. That's a great um, movie, by the way. Great movie, by the way. Right? It was Amazing. Awesome. Vince, uh, I wanted to ask if I can jump in real quick. So you mentioned, you know, you're working with these uh, young men and some of them started getting, you know, $700,000 wires. I, I can imagine myself at 21, 22 years old, like never mind 700000 I could get $1,200 and I, it might as well be like a bajillion dollars in my mind. And it really wouldn't matter what anyone would say to me. I think I had good people that were influences in my life but they would probably also be the ones that were benefiting off my $1,200. I guess, is that something where, where's the line? How do you insert yourself into there? Um, because you're kind of being that, you know, that I guess that figure of their life to, to try to do good. Where, walk me through that a little bit. Cause it's just kind of daunting to me. I'm, I'm obsessed with how you're doing that. It's, it's, it's tough a lot of times because there's a lot, you know, the lines get blurred with a lot of, players, agents, families, where doing, doing right by your client doesn't necessarily jive with what dad wants or mom wants or uncle wants or whatever. And for me, you just got to, you got to, you got to roll with your, your uh, number one job, which is to protect your client. And I've lost, I've lost clients over it. I'm like, Hey, you're my client. Here's what's going on. And dad will step in and, you know, mother at me or do whatever. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, sorry, man. Like, you know, you got to do what you got to do, but this is, yeah, this is my number one role. This is my number one job. I have an ethical, you know, obligation as an attorney and attorney client privilege, sure. all that jazz that, you know, that always follows me no matter what hat I'm wearing, whether it's a, as an agent or business CEO, or whatever. So, yeah, that's a great question, Luke. That reminds me when we were sitting uh, last fall, uh, Vince and I were on this project uh, with William Morris Endeavor, the big talent agency in Manhattan. Uh, we're sitting down with several different agents that work for that agency to include the Rocks agent, Bobby Flay's agent. And we heard some really tragic stories, you know, even big name celebrities losing, losing big deals that could have really worked for them on, on a business opportunity type of thing. But then it's that 
it's that entourage around them out, you know, the family, the friends, the manager that just kind of derails the whole thing. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's one of the things that after a decade, you know, in the industry, um, I said, I don't know that I'm, I don't know that I'm right for this world, uh, you know, long-term as far as just like, there's, you know, I've just seen a lot of, a lot of people in, in that sports and entertainment agent world where it's just kind of like you, they're playing to all sides and just saying whatever is necessary to keep the commission check rolling in. Mm-hmm. I can't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't jive with that. Yeah. I think that's, hey, Luke, I, you think that's a good segue into our questions from the audience? I think that's because fantastic. I think that's going to spark some other some other stuff, especially some controversy <laughs> around players in the NFL and how do your players handle that? So, um, Luke, you want to take question one? Yeah, I'll take question one. Question one is from Yasher Mack Foster in Georgia. And Mac is asking, what is the most important financial and legal advice you give to your clients? Uh, is image management such a major concern or do most of the clients handle themselves professionally knowing it can affect their value? It's a great question, Mac. It is. It's low. It's a loaded question to take the first part. Uh, let's see. Most important financial and legal advice. What's absolutely essential is you have to, on the financial side, you, you better save your money. You better save your money. These big checks are not going to be coming in for long. And the way the NFL is today, I mean, first round draft picks are out of the league 12 months later if they're, if they're not producing. Yeah. So what is, what is today's average career in the NFL in terms of length? Last years. I looked, it was like 2.66 years. Yeah. That's, wow. that's for everybody. That's fast. It's quick. Most first round draft picks, their contracts are guaranteed unless they do something really terrible um, or, or they get injured, you know, mm-hmm. riding a motorcycle or something you know, crazy. Still, you know, guys think that these checks are going to be coming in for eternity. Their agents are off, oftentimes on to the next guys or on to the next deal or, um, you know, not really providing oversight, continued oversight. Mm-hmm. Most important. Um, Financial is save your money, save your money. Um, and, and, and what we're doing with Hale is start, start working on your second career and you're, and you're, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to start a business, as long as it's not completely crazy and, um, you know, do your homework, mm-hmm. have, have a team around you to do your homework with you. Um, and, you know, start your second career, start your, your entrepreneurial path yeah. while you're playing. Don't wait, don't wait till the lights are off. Yeah, sure. That's, that's good. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say before we, um, after we get through these questions, I think that's a great, we end this podcast, this episode completely focused on Hale Ventures and consulting and what that's doing literally as the next stage uh, and the encouragement for these guys, like you said, while they're playing, after they're playing um, and so forth. So Let's go to uh, U.S. Army Colonel Tony Pirelli in Alabama. Tony's question is, I fully understand that agents procure and negotiate employment slash endorsement contracts for the athlete. However, do they feel a corporate slash social responsibility to ensure that the young athlete is properly managing, investing his or her money for the long term? Kind of goes with Mac's question a little bit. Nice Italian guy, Tony Perilli, I think. Yes. Nice Italian. Honestly, <laughs> I think, you know, I think, I think some guys sort of relish that uh, mentor role. A lot of, you know, reading a lot about Kobe Bryant, for instance, which was a horrible, terrible uh, tragedy. And, yeah, sure is. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think he, I think he was a guy that really started getting into the mentorship aspect and, and helping these guys, you know, look at the business side of things. You know, I think some guys do, but probably the great majority, to be completely frank, are they're going to get paid. They're going to go kind of live their life and they're not super concerned with the next guy. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> to something? Honest, to be honest. Do you see, do you see a lot of veteran players, um, like the guys that do make it past three, four or five years, taking the young guys under their wing or trying to at least offering it up 
I think peripherally, yes. I think, you know, guys, they're still in the locker room and some young guy comes in. Yeah, I think most guys are you know, really nice guys. And, hey, you should watch your money. And Marshawn Lynch with Seattle. Mm-hmm. He, he went back to the Seahawks, had this great run. I loved his comments. <laughs> his comments after the, after the loss to cost Green Bay, I think. Basically said, this, this does not last forever. Save your money. And his, I think he said something like, save your liquid or said something <laughs> yeah. way, way cooler than what I'm saying. But Sure. Um, so, some, yes. There was a, um, one of the Netflix specials or whatever. I don't know if it was the New York Jets. A couple of teams have done different specials on their spring, you know, or, or they're in training. Um, before the season starts and uh, there was a scene and one of the um, veteran players is talking to the to the young to the younger group uh, still in their in their first years or whatever Um, and he made a comment and I think it is just um, it is such a great comment and I think it goes in line even with the tagline for the show about you know be better know better and actually do better Um, he told the yeah hard knocks on HBO that's what it was um he told the young guys, like, look, man, if you're going to fail, if you're out on the field and you're going to fail, even in practice every day, you better do it at full speed, right? Cause, and that's, that's reminiscent of just going after it every single day. Do the absolute best that you can because guess what? Next year there's another round of, of draft picks coming in right behind you. Yeah. And if someone's, someone's going to do it a little better than you, eh, it might be it for you, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. So, Luke, you want to take next question? Yeah, absolutely. So this is uh, from Dean Precourt in Texas. And Dean asks, so in, in the NFL, as with most aspects of life, competition drives top results. How do you as an agent compete to offer the best results for those you hope to represent? Wow, that's that's a tough one, Dean. Well... <laughs> <laughs> We're putting you on the spot here, buddy. I know, my gosh. Um, I mean, the agency world in general is just is 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 wild. It's wild. Um, is my attorney here? Is that, do I have an attorney here? <laughs> you don't represent um, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? Your people that represent themselves are their worst clients. Whatever. Probably so. Um, <laughs> A lot of these agencies, I mean, they have runners, they have recruiters that live on campus, they have guys taking guys out tonight. I mean, all that kind of stuff you read about, it's frankly true. Money's being thrown around, all that other kind of jazz, just to be completely frank. Yeah. So, you know, it's, again, there were just a lot of aspects of the business that prompted me to go to Michigan and say, I don't really want to sit in a law office the rest of my life, hammer out forms and i i don't know that i want to stick in this so the comp i did we did that um did this business plan kind of talking about um the marriage of our portfolio company sports business council to hail uh, ventures and consulting moving forward one of the things that facts that came up was i think it was like 75 percent of all nfl players are repped by like three agencies or something. I was going to ask you that question. Yeah. So, so it's, there are a lot of guys repped by the same agencies yet 80% of NFL guys are broke within two years of leaving the game. They're not really doing a great job, but they're getting the players and the players are still going to them. Yeah. So um, I just kind of went in and I just said, look, you know, here's what, here's what I'm, I was brutally honest. Here's what I'm able to do for you. Here's my track record. I, you know, gotten guys drafted. I've helped guys, you know, get on teams. I'm going to look over your shoulder, help you with legal advisement, business advisory, mm-hmm. make sure your accountants are doing a good job. Make sure your financial advisors are doing a good job. I, I was frank and honest, and, you know, here's what the NFL teams are telling me. I'd show them, you know, what the NFL team said about them. And it resonated with some guys. And some guys said, well, this guy told me he's going to get me drafted in the first round. And I said, he's <laughs> lying to you. <laughs> And, um, but do what you got to do. And, and, you know, so I was frank, honest, um, developed a little bit of a track record of success. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. We're going to talk in a second as the segue to Hale Ventures and Consulting about, you know, they're broken a couple of years after they're done and why what we're trying to do next is so important. Right. So last question is from Robert Colbert in Wisconsin. 
If you could change one thing about the business of professional football, what would it be? Whew, that's, that's, Is there one thing? Yeah, I think, I think for, you know, you, you watch now being a, a little bit of a vet of the business now, these guys, I, th I think the general public thinks it's all glitz and glamour for these guys. It's not. These guys really don't have holidays with their families. They, they go through hell for those checks. They do. I mean, their bodies are just busted up. I've got the exact like statistic, but you know, getting in each tackles, like getting into a car accident, going 25 miles an hour. You have the, uh, Jared Wilson starts for the, for the Jaguars and he's a safety and Jared's one of your players, right? Yes. And, um, Michigan alum as well, by the way, but, uh, Jared just, I mean, you just watch him play week in and week out and just throwing his body around and yes, they get paid handsomely, but it's almost like the same thing. Um, uh, guys working on an oil rig that are, you know, guys, folks that work really dangerous jobs. And I understand oil, oil, uh, oil rig workers are not getting paid 10 million a year, but they get paid handsomely putting your body at risk like that. They should be paid. So the one big mm -hmm. thing I would change guaranteed contracts for NFL, um, NFL players, more guarantees. And, you know, just like if a baseball player cannot hit a, curveball or a fastball anymore they're, they're getting their 15 million a year whether they stink or you know same thing in the nba if you lost a step if you if you're not performing at a high level that money's guaranteed wow and i understand you know there's there's smaller rosters but there's also you know our our, our um, report that that we did but it's certainly more than uh it's it's the wealthiest league in sports Got more, it. more so than mlb more so than nba and um these guys, the NFL guys get, get the lowest amount of money, the lowest amount guaranteed guys are getting cut, released, signed, you know, every other week they're on the, you know, it's, 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 it's a madhouse. Yeah. It's a madhouse for these guys. And um, so I, I'd want more guaranteed money for the guys and the NFL PA and the NFL could come together and, and do like a catastrophic injury uh, insurance fund where God forbid one of these guys, you know, can't play anymore period. They could, they could, uh, draw from the insurance fund and still get these guys more money, but that'd be a great idea. NFLPA, if you're listening, do it. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be huge. National Especially Football League Players Association. If you didn't know what that meant, correct? Yes. That is our union. That's the union. Nice. Yeah, good that'd stuff. Be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, it sure would. So then, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to oh, say, I, I have some questions, uh, Vince, that we might, I don't know. We might edit them out. Maybe not. They're just like, they might be dumb Luke questions, but, but I had one, uh, what part of your job just like sucks the most? And let me preface that. So <clears throat> I've been in sales for a long time. So cold calling sucks, right? And for the listeners that don't know what a cold call is, it's when you call somebody that doesn't know you, that is not expecting your call and you try to set a meeting with them to sell them something is the ultimate goal. Now, you have to be, to be successful, you have to do it. Is there anything like, I'm not talking about the parts that you dread, but like parts of the job, because your job is awesome, but what parts of it are like behind the scenes that people don't get to see that uh, you have to do in order to be successful? If I didn't love football, I would never do this job ever. Really? Be because it, it is, it's, there, there's a lot of extraordinarily hard work for frankly, not, not a ton of remuneration. The travel. The travel at, you got you to gotta go meet these guys when they're off. When are these guys off? Like the week, you know, holidays. They'll get mm -hmm. a day off. So, you know, leaving my little family at, at four in the morning to hop a flight, you know, yeah. to go to Florida the day after Christmas or the Christmas Eve or, you know. So those, those times kind of stunk and um, just have hysterical travel stories, which we'll not get into, but uh, another time for another day. But um, so just – the grind, you know, just the day-to-day -day grind. And then you got to kind of be on from like 7 a.m. to like midnight. You know, you don't know when something might happen. You got players on different coasts and different time zones. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, definitely a, a lot. And, you know, you're not, you're not sort of clocking in and, 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 and getting it, you know, getting your, your paycheck. So ton of risk and yeah, so it was, Wow, 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 for sure. 
Wow. And I love questions like that because I think people look at it from the outside and they say, wow, like Vince's life is probably great. You know, I love football too. I want to do something within the NFL, but they don't see what happens on the inside, you know, to really make all of this happen and what's going on in the background the years of work that went into getting this result. And I guess one other question I had um, beyond that is what's, What's the most rewarding thing, like money aside, money aside and everything else, what's the most rewarding part of the job that, you know, you would do even if money or career wouldn't, wouldn't be a part of it? The highest times. So like the NFL draft, NFL draft weekend, I would get sick uh, for like a week after every NFL draft because it's just like a four day, no sleep at all type of, type of run. You're stressed out. Families, families are depending on you. Clients are depending on you. Um, and I, you know, again, honesty for me is the best policy. Hey, here's what the team said. You know, Hey, here's, here, this, this is, this is kind of where we're at heading into this weekend. Most exciting moment for me ever, uh, in the business was, um, my, my first draft pick year three. Again, everybody's like, you're out of your mind. You're not, you know, everybody mm-hmm. fails going into this business. You're, you're not, you know, you don't know anyone. Your dad's not in this, but you know, what are you doing? Whatever, like 28 months into it, <laughs> into it, day two draft pick, shocked the world. Nobody expected this guy to get drafted super high, L- literal elation. Uh, <laughs> like I was just so, I didn't sleep. He didn't sleep. The fan, you know, it was just wow. on par with the birth of my children. And Mar- I mean, it was, wow. it was, it was big. It was big. And I'll never forget that. And, that wasn't even like the most lucrative deal I ever did, but it was, it was the most exciting for sure. That's pretty that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah that's super amazing. cool. So one thing we had, um, we had numerous questions and you can take this answer and you can go right into before we wrap up, let's make sure we talk about Hale Ventures and consulting and what's next. Right. We had multiple people um, write in and want to talk about for the players uh, and education and really centered around colleges and universities not just for what they're doing uh, for their college players, but even for the current active NFL players where they bring them back. Um, And we'll use our alma mater, right? University of Michigan, Ross School of Business. Uh, There's an NFL Academy uh, at the business school. Uh, Talk about finance, business, money management in general. And I remember um, one story uh, from our professor who runs the NFL Academy, Len Middleton, who we nicknamed Big Daddy by the way. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Professor Middleton, but uh, we love you. And we had we just had to get that out there and get that on there. He told a story one day uh, where he asked the players in, the, in the, the group that came. And I thought it's very admirable that the university brings players, their spouses, whomever comes. It's like a week-long immersion, I think. Big schedule. We looked at the schedule that they're going through. Uh, but, you know, it's the question like, yeah, you have the money now and you can afford to buy a Ferrari, Porsche, Lamborghini, whatever. And there's a price tag with that, but it's opening their eyes to, well, how much does an oil change cost for a Lamborghini? You know, and you might get the responses, like he said, you know, a hundred bucks, 150 bucks. And when he says, no, it's more along the lines of six or $7,000 just to change the oil for a Lamborghini because they have to take out the engine to even change the oil. Yeah. Access. Right. So it's, it's those types of expenses that the university in this academy is trying to just one piece of it, right? Sure. Uh, educate them on. Do you think? Do you think colleges and universities are doing enough? Is there enough participation? It's a combination of factors. I think. Like you talked about, these guys sort of they're they're like hometown legends. Yeah. Just 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 coming up through high school, they're getting national attention as fourteen year olds for the most part, and you know, NBA guys and MLB guys, maybe even worse, not worse, even younger, I should say. So these guys are coming into college. They're, they're legends, man. They're, they're living legends. And um, so, you know, their, their heads are already kind of pumped up, have a bunch of yes people around them, you know, starting early age. And then the schools, you know, I think they're kind of pumping these guys in and out. Like people care to an extent, but I think, I think some schools are taking a harder look at educating these guys young about the actual business of, of the NFL mm-hmm. or NBA or MLB or, you know, uh, professional sports in general or entertainment. For the most part, 
they're collecting their paychecks or excuse me, collecting their, you know, their, whatever, their royalty checks from TV and sponsorships. And yeah, sure. Ohio state university, the Ohio state university, some clients from there too. Great, great guys. I've heard they do a great job in their, in their athletic department of, of educating these guys and um, prepping them for, for life in the NFL and saving. I think the NFL PA has done, you know, a really good job over the years of starting to really hammer those, those points home. And I disagree with a lot of the stuff that, that they don't do, but mm-hmm. that's one thing I think that they've really hammered home with these guys. It, Luke, you touched on it. Like, hell man, when I was 22, you give me a, give me a check at, you know, for, <laughs> for 700 grand, I would have, I would have blown right through it. For yeah. Sure. Oh, quickly, quickly. Um, so I think it's getting better. Um, but there needs, there needs to be more. Yeah. So where does that take us for Hale Ventures and Consulting? I don't know, 2017 or so. Years are starting to blend together, changing diapers and school and work and everything else. But about 2017, um, I started saying, okay, you know, I'm getting close to a decade here in this business, you know, year seven or whatever. Um, I, I kind of caught myself like really disliking certain aspects of, of the quote unquote traditional agency, NFL agency business. You know, you see guys that have made $50 million in their career, they're broke, broke. You know, it's just like, what the hell are like professionals doing mm-hmm. for these guys really? You know, it's just kind of a glad handing, plasticky type of type of BS uh, through a lot of different aspects of, of the industry. So I, I sort of said, these are the aspects I really like. I really like, you know, being an advisor. I really like helping these guys, you know, negotiate their contracts, go to, go to, uh, get into the NFL. But then I really like the oversight. I really like being an entrepreneur. I really mm-hmm. like starting businesses. Um, and as, as a lawyer, as a business lawyer, you know, I, I, I helped start everything from a medical marijuana company to an apparel company you know, mm-hmm. to, to a nursing home, you know, so had a sort of a diverse education, I guess, in different businesses and industries. So I try to marry everything together and, and go get, am I allowed to say ass? Go get my ass absolutely whooped at uh, University of Michigan Ross School of Business, which I did. Um, and then just, just really sort of got sort of deep into the quantitative yeah. part of life. Mm-hmm. To marry it all together, the legal, the the advi- life advisory, and then add sort of the quantitative, become become a Excel spreadsheet nerd. Get with these guys and say, look, I'm not going to sit here and kiss your rear end and tell you I'm going to get you on uh, ballers and get you an Old Spice commercial. Here are the facts. Mm-hmm. Look at Forbes, you know, top paid athletes list. NFL guys get dirt. And those are the top of the top in the NFL, $50,000 off. I mean, the the stats are there. And so I said, quit focusing on this nonsense of, of $50,000, you know, let's go make $50 million. Yeah. Let's go start. So you're talking 50 grand from a, from an endorsement or. Yes. Yeah. Which isn't what you would, what you would expect. Right. So they're not getting it. There's other ways to set themselves up for a much longer, much longer period of time, second careers, you know, let's find out what those avenues are. What are they interested in? What are they interested in? Where are their passions? You know, where can they take life after football thinking about it while they're in football? So they're making good decisions with the money that they're making at the time, putting it away, saving it. You know, one of the, largest barriers to entry for any business sometimes is capital, right? And is that where the, the ventures piece of Hale VC comes into play, helping them find whatever level of capital that they need, find investors, whatever the case might be. Absolutely. And, and these guys are, a lot of these guys go broke because they are providing all the capital. Yeah. So we're kind of helping them see the light here. Hey, you want to start a vegan fast food chain? Don't, you know, a, you cannot fund it yourself. B, we understand, you know, we'll put some time and some of our own capital in, but we need to go seek outside investment. And 
traditional agencies are just not even touching any of those type of things. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Wow. So Good. It's hailvc.com, folks. Um, by the time this episode is published, uh, you will be able to look that up and you'll see Vince and um, all the things that Hale VC, Hale Ventures and Consulting is doing. Just want to give a huge shout out to you, Vince, for, for doing that and, um, you know, keeping people's dreams alive. You know, these guys, I look at it um, when you're talking elite, ath- I mean, they're elite athletes, whether they're an NFL player, an Olympic athlete. I mean, these people are elite, right? It's like the um, Warren Buffetts of business and, you know, Bill Gates, you know, your elite business and entrepreneurs and so forth. They're special. They're talented. They have the, they have the grit to go the distance, the discipline, the commitment, you know, like your special forces and the, your Navy SEALs and your military folks that just get the, the dedication and the commitment. And then it's harnessing all of that, putting it in a, uh, in a way to push them down the road. And I applaud you for that. That's great. I could not have said that any better. I don't think I could have said it as good as actually. And, um, but no, these, you know, these guys were trying to help them see the light in terms of like, you cannot base your entire life on, on sports. You have all, all these talents, mm-hmm. grit, the drive. So what if, you know, football's over, basketball's over, MLB, you know, baseball's over. So what? Let's go do the, take that, take your talents and let's go put them into a new gig or, or, or your business or whatever. Mm-hmm. So a little, little different, a lot different of a wrinkle. Um, and we're super excited to team with you and Marcy and all of our strategic partners throughout, you know, whatever, throughout the country. Yep. And we're, we're excited to go uh, sort of tackle the next chapter. Awesome. Luke, any parting thoughts? <clears throat> Bo, I can't add like any value on top of what you just said. I'm going to, you know, second Vince that you just said that beautifully, but you know, I just, uh, Vince, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, you know, our inaugural, uh, episode here, uh, you know, I thank you on behalf of the, the Bo and Luke nation that we're going to start here. Um, you know, that I'm sure is going to follow, but we really appreciate you being on the show and, uh, just re- also really appreciate just the great things that you're doing for these young guys out there, uh, young guys and girls out there. And, um, you know, let Bo and I know whatever we can do to help because uh, we really believe in it as well. Well, I look forward to hopefully seeing you in DC area, uh, Valentine's weekend. And, um, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, you did a fantastic job. I'm going to give a (laughs) shout out to the Kalo family. Thank you for sharing, uh, your husband and your father with us today. Um, we really appreciate that. And Vince, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Not, now you're trying to get the waterworks going. That's right. Kids. That's a wrap. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, thanks gentlemen.